This video is brought to you by Squarespace. This is the Sigma FP. As of the recording of this video, this is the smallest full frame mirrorless camera that you can buy. It's a cinema camera and a stills camera. And it's got a lot of really good features, a lot of things going for it, and a lot of things which really aren't ideal at all. It's been out now for almost a year. The big question is, does it have a future? And that's what I'm going to look at in this video. I've wanted to make a video about this camera for quite some time. And I've had quite a few requests from people asking me as well. And I've come close, but Basically, what I've been waiting for is for it to mature into a better camera because what I've seen from it physically is a really lovely design and a lovely idea. What I've had from shooting with it is not the same experience as that, but it has gotten a lot better with firmware that came out in June 2020, version two firmware. I was working with Sigma beta testing that version 2 firmware for a while and when it did come out definitely huge improvements over so many aspects of it but not quite enough that I felt that it needed and I'm going to go through those in a little bit but let's talk about the positives first. It will be so easy to just ignore this camera with all these other amazing cameras that have come out but it does have unique things. And what I really like about it is it's absolutely tiny with a full frame sensor with a beautiful image from the 24.6 megapixel sensor, a 6K sensor, the down samples to a lovely 4K that records raw from the USB-C into an SSD that you put on the camera. Tiniest raw recording, beautiful image camera you can get. That is what this camera is all about. It's what makes it unique. For me, this does feel like the true successor to the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera in that it is small, whereas the actual Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera, of course, isn't small, but it's a very, very good camera. It's not full frame, but it's a very good camera. And the 6K one especially has a fantastic image but it's, it's not a pocket camera at all. For me, that camera always felt like the successor to the Blackmagic cinema camera. I think it's called so many of the names get so confusing. Part of the reason why they've managed to get this camera so small is there are some things which aren't in it, which other cameras have. Mainly a mechanical shutter, which you'll use for stills. No EVF, which for me is one of the biggest downsides. The screen doesn't articulate or anything like that, but quite a few cameras don't do that. And there's no image stabilization in the camera. These are the main reasons how they could get it to be so small. And the size of it, keeping it small, is absolutely key to this camera. The moment you start building it up into a beast, then the whole concept of this camera for me goes out the window. The first footage that I put out with the camera was back in November 2019 at night time. And that was all handheld and using the internal recording in dot mob, which is only 8 bit sadly. I didn't use the raw. Part of the reason was, well, I wanted to see what that dot mob was like because it's way more practical with file sizes. But the camera, without having any IBIS, the only stabilization you have, unless you have an optical stabilized lens, is the electronic stabilization in it, which is okay. It's not brilliant, but it's okay. But it does only work with the dot mov. It doesn't work with the raw. So that's why I shot with it. But dynamic range, very challenging because of that lack of log recording in there. 
and there is a tone curve that you can adjust. You can lift up your shadows, but it's an 8-bit codec. I, I think it's just too risky. You're far better off doing that same thing in post rather than doing it in camera, baking it in and maybe not getting great results. I did shoot a little bit of RAW for myself just to compare and yeah, it looked so much better. And it showed me what this camera could be capable of. And it brings us on to the viewfinder or the director's loop. And this was, for me, the most irritating part of the camera in a way, because there's no EVF. I was like, this is the only way I'm gonna be able to actually you know, use this camera because I do wear glasses. Um, you know, I can't see that close up. Well, I can with these. Um, and also when you're holding it out like this, you don't have that stability. When you have an EVF, you're pressing it against your body so you have points of contact. You know, I like the design of it and stuff, it's cool. Not that cheap. And the way you attach it onto the camera is not like a clip-on or anything like that. It's screwed on with two Allen keys. Really not ideal at all. I've actually solved that a little bit by getting some M3, sorry that's but getting some M3 thumb screws. I think these are 12 millimeters, I think. Not super quick, but at least I don't need to get out an Allen key. So I can, there we go. Almost on. So there we go. So it's on now. It's just if I wanna get it off, I have to unscrew it and make sure I don't lose those um, thumb screws. Still better than having to have an Allen key on you and those screws that went in there, which I have lost for sure. Now, I did try and use the Zakuto Z Finder on here, but there's a coating on the glass which stops you being able to have anything stuck on there, which is what you need for the frame. So not ideal at all, so you have to use this. This is my little rig with my old Bolex 8mm shoulder rest and this is fantastic it gives you lovely stability which is essential to this camera I like that a lot don't ask me where you can get it from it came with a very very old camera the footage I just showed you from London wasn't using this rig it was just the bare bones but the footage was stable because I was using that electronic stabilization if you shoot raw, you don't get that. There is no electronic stabilization. So you need to get that camera more stable because you've got those micro jitters from the rolling shutter. So you have two main options, really. An optical image stabilized lens or a rig which gives you more stability. Or ideally, both actually. The lack of mechanical shutter doesn't affect the video at all. It does affect the stills though, because the readout from the sensor isn't super fast. You are basically shooting what other mirrorless cameras would call silent mode. And so it's very susceptible to skewing and stuff, so which due to that rolling shutter. So it's not an ideal stills camera. So I think the key part of it really is the video side. There's two separate menus for Cine or Still. I'm going to obviously go through the Cine ones here. 
It's an attractive looking design, a little bit fiddly to navigate though because there's no little joystick, it's just a dial which you have to move around and up and down left and right. It does look like a touch screen but it's not, that would be really nice. Let's start off with our exposure settings, we do have shutter angle which is great. The camera is dual ISO with a native low sensitivity of 100 and high of 3200. They're not separated into ISOs in each of them like some of the video cameras have. You have them all in one lump. So just be careful when you are using them. The ones which are just below 3200 are gonna be quite noisy. So just push yourself up to the higher base ISO. The highest ISO we can go to is 25,600. There are higher if we go into the expanded range, but 25,600 is where you don't really want to go past. It's actually pretty good. In our record modes, we do have Super 35 mode, which is very nice and useful. It is a 6K sensor. Now the record settings, this is where it gets a little bit confusing. I try and simplify it. It's all dependent on whether you're recording to the SD card the SSD or externally via HDMI. So let's start with the SD card and what you can do. You can record Cinema DNG RAW to the SD card of the appropriate speed, but in 4K it's 8-bit and it's only up to 25p, so 24p or 23.98 and 25p. In Full HD mode you can record 12-bit up to 60p. If you're recording to the SSD, which I do recommend for video, then you will get 4K, this is UHD by the way, 4K, UHD, 12-bit RAW, up to 30p. In HD, you can have 12-bit up to 100p, so from 23.98 to 100p. If you want the 120p, you need to drop down to 10-bit. You following me? You can record the 8-bit 420.mov to either the USB-C SSD or the SD card. Not the same time though, it's one or the other, so no redundant backups. And if you are going to record in .mov, just stick to all I don't bother with the long op. It's not worth it, not in the size difference you're going to get. But personally, if I'm going to record with this camera, Cinema DNG. Our last way of recording is via the HDMI, so we can get 12-bit ProRes RAW and Blackmagic RAW, depending on which recorder you've got. So with the Ninja 5 from Atomus, yes, it's 5. The V means 5. It's the Roman numeral 5, because it's a 5-inch screen. That's why it's called 5, not Ninja V. Please call it Ninja 5. That's ProRes RAW. And with the Blackmagic Video Assist, it's B RAW. Strangely, you cannot get a 10-bit 422 signal out of this to record straight ProRes. I don't know why. There is one thing I haven't mentioned, you can set the USB-C out so the camera works as a native webcam. There is definitely some lag on there, so you need to use some software to, you know, make that all nice and sync. But lovely feature, every camera should do this. So with the help of Flora, let's go through the profiles that we have in the camera. We don't have S-Log and apparently they won't be putting S-Log in because it's not capable of doing it. I don't know why, don't ask me. But these are our profiles. And when I shot this, there wasn't the color mode off. That is something I will talk about in a little bit. What I suggest is shooting in neutral and bringing that contrast to the minimum, sharpness to the minimum, and drop our saturation down a little bit. Pretty much what I did with the Canon 5D Mark II for years. So what is this color mode off? Well, it takes away the contrast and saturation, a lot of the processing of the image to make it flatter, but they've left the artificial sharpening in there. As you can see, it's, yeah, it's not good. If they can remove that, then we'll have a pretty nice flat picture profile to use. I don't think it's gonna get as close to the 12.5 stops of dynamic range the camera's capable of. For that, you need to go into the RAW, but it'll be a lot better than what we've got. 
I do go on about how much I hate the digital sharpening that cameras introduce, and especially to cameras that you cannot turn it off. Some people think it looks nice. I don't. Hopefully these examples show you that it doesn't look nice. Look, if you want to make it look as horrible as that in post, you can do. You just add all that sharpness. I just like to start with a nice, natural, unprocessed image. Before we get on to the section you've really been waiting for, which is how good the autofocus is, here's a quick message from the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. I've been using them since 2015 when my website was redesigned, splitting the huge blog off into its own beast and having a lovely, tidy, beautiful section for my work section to get hired to get all my jobs. And for someone like me who literally does know nothing about coding, the templates and the way that it works, so easy to maintain, so easy to update, so easy to create new pages. Before this, I had to have a webmaster who looked after everything for me. Now I can do it myself. You can get 10% off a domain and your own websites with the link in the description below. There is an autofocus menu, which is a bit of a tease because it doesn't work very well. I mean, it's, it's okay occasionally, but I would just stay with manual focus. Absolutely stay with manual focus. We do have peaking, so yeah, definitely stay with manual focus. There's no L mount cameras with autofocus that's come anywhere near close to what Canon and Sony are capable of. The best that I've seen is that Panasonic S5, which is an amazing camera. The autofocus is definitely better than other ones that I've used, but still not great because it is still contrast based. Of course, I would love to have this fantastic autofocus in the Sigma FP, in fact, in all of the Panasonic cameras, but we won't have it in there until they move away from pure contrast based into a phase detection hybrid system like the Sony's do. It's the only way we're going to get fast, accurate, smooth, natural, reliable autofocus. Interesting little thing is a director's viewfinder mode. So we can set it up to these fancy expensive cameras and see what it would look like if we had that lens on that camera, which is interesting. And you can record this way as well. I mean, I have apps on my iPhone, which do a similar thing and we'll zoom in on the image to sort of show you what it looked like when we have a, a longer lens. It's there if you want it, it's interesting. So to recap, what I think this camera really needs to set it apart from everything else about it, because there's so many cameras out there, to make the most of this size, which is the key thing and must not be ignored, it needs to have an EVF. It does have this electronic connection on the side. I don't know what it's capable of. At the moment, the only accessory out there gives it a hot shoe. If it's capable of an EVF, that would transform the camera. It needs to be a small EVF, nothing huge. If you look back at the Sony RX1's EVF that you put on the MI shoe, that was pretty damn good, nice and small. The other thing we need is even more important than that, and that is lossless compressed Cinema DNG recording out of the USB-C into that SSD. Yes, it can record wonderful 12-bit ProRes RAW out of the HDMI into an Atomos Ninja 5, and that's wonderful, but it adds bulk. Yes, all the other cameras out there even the ones similar priced, do have many higher end features. They have things like EVS, they have stabilization. They have the ability to record ProRes RAW out of the HDMI. But just record straight to an SSD in that size, that's its selling point with the full frame, with the size. I think I've got my point across there. I truly hope but these two things can happen because I really believe this camera can have a future if that happens. And I really, really want it to have a future because that image is lovely, really lovely.